Recently, I've been spending a lot of my free time working on the Portswigger Web Security Academy Labs. You may have noticed that I've made a couple videos recently covering some of those. Part of the reason is just that I'm annoyed that in my profile it still says that I'm a newbie because I haven't finished all the Apprentice Labs. So I've kind of slowly been making my way through all of the 58 Apprentice Labs just so it won't say newbie anymore when I look at my profile. But I've also personally just been feeling like I'm not good enough at some of those more outside of the box type of attacks. Whether that's things that are using different sorts of technologies that I'm less familiar with, whether that's like GraphQL or like AI chatbots and things like that, or things that are more like logic based, like things outside of the normal kind of workflow that you see in an application. Things like two-factor authentication or something related to resetting a password or something that's just a little bit outside of the normal workflow of an application that you're used to testing. And since I'm spending so much time on these labs in my personal time anyway, I may as well double dip and try to make some videos out of them. And maybe some of these labs will kind of help you along your journey as well and make you a better pen tester or bug bounty hunter or whatever it is you're trying to do. So in this video, I'm going to go over two different labs related to bypassing two-factor authentication. And the first one is going to be 2FA Simple Bypass. This lab works with a web application where it assumes that you already have a user's credentials. You could have gotten that in many different ways. For example, you could have enumerated users and brute forced a password, which I've actually covered that in another lab previously. So if you want to check that out, I'll have that linked up here. Or you could have like fished a user. You could have just stolen it off of a post-it note on someone's desk. There are many different ways you could have gotten a user's credentials, but this application you're working with also has two-factor authentication. So even though you have the username and password, you still can't access their account because of that second factor. And we need to figure out how to bypass that two-factor authentication. So first I'm gonna open the lab in a second tab, and I'm also gonna go ahead and open up Burp Suite. And once that lab opens, I'm going to open a browser inside Burp Suite, and I'm going to copy that URL into the Burp Suite browser. Now we're able to intercept that traffic using the Burp Suite HTTP history, and I'm going to go to my account, and I'm going to log in with the credentials that they gave us in the instructions so I can actually see how this whole two-factor authentication workflow works with an account that I actually have access to. So when we log in, it says, please enter your four-digit security code. And in the lab, they actually give us this email client. And when we open that, that gives us access to this little inbox, which is very similar to emulating what you would have if you actually had like a Gmail account or whatever that associated with an account, you would receive this email in that email inbox. And this email says your security code is 0183. So I'm gonna go back to this page and I'm gonna type in 0183 log in and I have access to my account. So if we look back through our HTTP history and kind of get an idea of how this whole workflow works, we see that there was originally this post request to this slash login endpoint, and that's where we submitted our credentials. Then there was this get request to login to, and that was that page that was asking for that four digit security code. And then after that, there was a get request that got this my account page with the username in the parameter in the URL. So that's pretty interesting. Having that ID parameter in the URL, that tells us that we might be able to mess with that and be able to access a different user's account. And looking back to the instructions, the user that we're trying to hack, their name is Carlos and their password is Montoya. So first, I don't think this is gonna work, but I'm gonna send this get request to the repeater and I'm going to change that ID parameter just to the username we're trying to get. And I'm going to say, Carlos send 302 found, follow redirection. Okay, that just sent us back to the login page. I didn't really think that was gonna work, but anytime I see a parameter like that in the URL, I wanna mess with it and try to send it to a different user or some other content that I shouldn't have access to just to make sure they're actually handling like session management and all that stuff correctly. But now I'm gonna to try to log in with that Carlos account using their credentials and see if I can mess with that workflow for the two-factor authentication to access their account. So first I'm going to put in the username and password and click login. And again, it's asking me for that four digit security code, but I don't have the four digit security code because I don't have access to Carlos's email address. So this time, because I don't have access to that MFA code, I'm actually going to take that get request to the login to, which is the page that is asking for that four digit code. And I'm actually going to change that URL in the get request from login to, to my account. And you'll notice earlier when we submitted this request that didn't work, 
it was using a session token cookie. And on this request, the session token has changed. So my hope is that through the session management on the back end, they've actually already given this account access to everything it would normally have access to if it submitted that MFA code. And all that's actually stopping that account from getting all that information is the workflow within the application. But if we try to submit a request to a specific URL in that application beyond where the MFA code is, it'll still give us access to it even though we haven't submitted that MFA code. So if we send this request, congratulations, you solved the lab and we have access that my account page for Carlos. So that was a very simple two-factor authentication bypass. But for this video, I also wanted to take a look at a second lab for two-factor authentication. And that's this two-factor authentication broken logic lab. And this one's actually listed as a practitioner lab. So it's meant to be a little bit more difficult. And the instruction says that this lab's two-factor authentication is vulnerable due to its flawed logic. To solve the lab, access Carlos's account page. So again, I'm gonna open that lab in a second tab. And then once that lab finishes loading, I'm going to load it into the browser inside Burp Suite. And I'm going to log in with the credentials that they gave us in the instructions. And once again, they're asking for a four digit security code. And I'll go to the email client that they give us access to and the security code is 0260. And when I put in that four digit code, click log in and I get access to my account. And once again, if we go back and look through the HTTP history, we can see sort of the workflow of how this whole process works. Again, we have a post request to the login endpoint where it submits the username and password. Then there's a get request, which is the form that asks for the four digit code. And then another post request to login to, which submits that MFA code. And then a get request to the accounts my account page. If we send this request to the repeater and take a look at that request though, you'll notice that there is a new cookie called verify, which has the username that we're actually working with. So that's interesting. That's something different that we didn't see last time. And you notice that this cookie is also in the post request to the login to endpoint. So it seems like every request after you submit the credentials, they actually submit that verify cookie in the header of every request. But something that I'm noticing is we first have this post request that submits the username and password, and then it calls the get request for login to, and there is no username and password submitted with that request. All that it is submitted that is related to the credentials at all is that verify cookie with the username. So I'm going to send this request to repeater and I'm going to change that verify cookie to Carlos, which is the username that we're trying to get access to. And if I send that request, it's asking for a four digit code. So we're basically able to completely bypass the requirement of submitting a password in order to get to this stage in the workflow. So at this point, we can assume that a four digit code has been submitted to Carlos's email address. But again, we don't have access to Carlos's email. So it seems that after you get beyond that stage in the workflow where you submitted that username and password, it is basically just using this verify cookie to determine what account is actually being accessed. So I'm going to log out of my account in the browser and I'm going to start this process again and I'm going to go to my account. I'm going to submit my credentials again. And if I look at the email server, I see that the correct security code is 1731 but I'm going to submit an incorrect code. So I'll just submit 1111, log in, incorrect security code. So now I'm going to take a look at that request and I'm going to send to intruder. And I'm actually going to try to brute force this code, but instead of brute forcing my code from my account, I'm actually going to change that verify cookie to Carlos so I can actually brute force that code that was sent to Carlos's email address. And as a quick aside, this is actually something that I've seen several times in mobile apps that I've tested during my day job. A lot of mobile applications that I've seen actually will not use a password at all. They'll just have like an email address or a phone number associated with your account. I've seen this for things like dating apps and like other kinds of apps that aren't like the most security conscious like you would see in like a banking app or something. And instead of using a big, long, complex password like you would see in banks or things like that, they actually just require a one-time code that is sent to either your email address or is sent as a text message, something like that. And then you just submit that code in the application. And a few times I've seen it where there's no rate limiting, there's no brute force protection or anything like that on that code. 
And if it's just a four digit code or a five digit code or even a six digit code, it is not that complex to brute force that code, especially if it's only numbers. So I know that a lot of these labs that you see in things like the Web Security Academy or some other websites that have these practice labs, a lot of them are not super realistic. They're just sort of like very beginner friendly and kind of meant to just like introduce ideas and concepts to you so that you can see that in other applications that are more complex. But this specific scenario I've actually seen in mobile apps that I've tested in the past. But that little tangent aside, let's get back to the lab. So I'm going to use the verify cookie to say that we are looking at the MFA code for Carlos. And I'm going to highlight that MFA code and I'm going to click this add button to make that the payload that we're actually messing with. I'm going to choose to use brute forcer and I'm gonna make the character set zero to nine minimum length four, max length four. I know my camera's covering it, but there is a button in Intruder if you're not used to it, kind of like right here-ish, sort of where my face is behind my camera that says start attack. So just click that start attack button. And I am actually using the community edition to solve these labs for this video. So it is kind of slow to run Intruder on community edition, but if you had Burp Suite Pro, it would be much, much faster. And if we take a look at some of these payloads, so let's look at the payload 1000. For this request, it submitted an MFA code of 1000, and the response says incorrect security code. So I'm gonna let this run for a little while because like I said, it is going to be kind of slow on the community edition. A little longer than a few minutes later. Okay, so I'm back. It's been a while. It's actually been several hours at this point. And at one point, the whole application actually timed out and I had to restart the session and then restart the intruder, which can sometimes happen if you leave an intruder session running for a long time unattended and the website is just idle. But again, a reminder, this is the community edition and it kind of throttles the intruder scan. So it is much slower than it would be on the professional edition, which is what I use during my day job. Using Burp Suite Pro would have done this in a fraction of the time but you can see that I have sorted all the results by status code and most of them were a 200 result and if I look at them most of them responded incorrect security code but one of them responded with a 302 status code and this was using the MFA code 0813 and if I right click this and say show response in browser and then I copy that then I'm going to paste that into a new tab in my browser and I'm going to go to that website and I just got access to Carlos's My Account page and congratulations, you solved the lab. So in this video, I went over two different labs from the Web Security Academy from Portswigger and both of them involved bypassing the two-factor authentication in a web app. The first one was just a very simple bypass where they weren't handling the session management correctly. And the second one involved actually brute forcing that multi-factor authentication code, which is something very similar to the type of thing I've actually seen in real mobile apps I've tested as part of my job. So I hope this was interesting or helpful to you in some way. And I'm probably going to continue spending some of my free time working on these port swigger labs just because I really want to get that newbie tag off of my profile. But if there are any other topics from the Web Security Academy or any other similar labs like this that you want me to take a look at, let me know in the comments and I'll see what I can do.